uh, yes uh, good evening everyone and uh, warm welcome to i sincerely thank tas and hetal sir for giving me this opportunity to go live on facebook this is my amateur attempt at it so please accept my apologies preemptively in case there is any technical glitch which i suppose has already taken place um, so i suppose i am audible now uh, shall i go ahead with the presentation Uh, with the ongoing covid pandemic it is very hard to actually talk on non covid issues but i have promised myself not to utter anything related to corona for the next th say 30 to 45 minutes and i hope to keep my promise as well so you a brief outline of today's talk i would be first giving you the introduction then the causes of cardiac arrest in pregnancy then the impact of pregnancy on cardiac arrest followed by differential diagnosis and lastly the prevention and management interestingly i am not going to talk of any of these topics today simply because all this is theory and can be read in the literature books or on the web then what's the aim of the session today well my objective is to first give you the practical tips to give you important clinical pearls so that at the end we have a better outcome and improved survival so we are going to talk about all practical related issues and nothing much about theory today the first question that arises is why do we have to focus on cardiac arrest in obstetrics in the first place when we all know probably it is not that common but maybe we should have a look at this news which says more women experience cardiac arrest during childbirth than is actually reported so especially in developing countries there may be under reporting and hence the low incidence but as a matter of fact even if the cardiac arrest in pregnancy may be relatively rare it is almost always fatal and the survival rate is merely 50% knowledge deficit and poor resuscitation skills contribute to the poor outcomes so shouldn't this topic be of more interest to the obstetricians than the anesthetists strikingly or should i say unfortunately it is evident that nearly one in four cardiac arrests in pregnancy are associated with complications of obstetric anesthesia and therefore it becomes imperative for us to discuss about on table collapse in obstetrics and that is how i am trying to justify why i chose this topic today broadly we can classify on table collapse into two either it could be near miss or an established cardiac arrest needless to say both are equally dangerous and i am going to discuss both these conditions with different case scenarios like i promised earlier i am not going to talk of physiological changes in pregnancy and its impact on cardiac arrest outcome but certainly i am going to talk about the psychology of the anesthetist who has come to attend the cesarean call and its impact on cardiac arrest outcome now it may sound very irrelevant at this moment but soon you will all agree upon the significance of the anesthetic psyche and the outcome let us now begin with the case scenarios i have a small disclaimer here the two cases that i will be presenting are not purely hypothetical and even if i may be using a direct speech it is not necessary that i am the one who has actually conducted the cases or these cases are from a institute so this is a small confession to maintain the confidentiality so let us begin with the case one before actually reading out the case let me tell you that uh, we have uh, different ot's and ot postings are such that the professor and the ap are kept constant for 3 to 4 months in particular unit say obstetrics or orthopedics while the lecturer is on a rotational duties as would be in many institutes so on this particular day i had a lecturer who was working in the ortho till the previous day and he had come to obstetrics on that particular day coming to the patient she was a 26 years old primary gravida posted for elective lses for postdatism she had 
no other comorbidities vitals were stable and she was planned under spinal anesthesia which was given with the conventional doses i was in the adjoining ot for a laparoscopic hysterectomy and soon i was called by a resident to the section ot saying that there was a problem so i rushed to the ot to find that a resident is trying to hold the oxygen mask on the patient lecturer is struggling to get the iv access the previous one was apparently out a reverse trendelenburg position is been given to the patient probably to prevent the ascent of spinal anesthesia meanwhile i also question regarding the sensory level which i told which i was told is t4 the obstetric resident was also trying to help she was searching for iv line on the lower limbs i looked at the patient she was irritable restless on the monitors i could see a normal sinus rhythm on the ecg the heart rate was 58 per minute which was down from 96 per minute which was the baseline reading on the saturation probe there was no tracing the pulse was feeble and the bp not recordable now anyone can diagnose this condition over here yes it was high spinal and the necessary intervention was made which brought things back to normal is our so simple easy rapid predictable spinal anesthesia capable of causing this near miss crisis in obstetrics well the answer to this question is a big yes there is lot of evidence to show that spinal anesthesia induced complications are known and highly prevalent in obstetric practice so what intervention was done in this near miss following spinal it is obviously no rocket science but then why the competent anesthetist could not manage here is where the psyche of the anesthetist comes into picture like i mentioned earlier my lecturer a very efficient person who gave spinal or who gave anesthesia spinal for tkr thrs and all kind of lower limb surgeries till the previous day in ortho when was asked to give anesthesia all of a sudden for cesarean section he made certain mistakes or should i say he forgot some important relevant points of obstetric anesthesia that led to this near miss situation similarly for example in uh, private practice you may be doing a very complicated geriatric patient with hypertension diabetes isd for say emergency appendectomy under spinal anesthesia there is hell lot of a difference for this spinal anesthesia and the spinal that you would give for cesarean section no it's not only limited to the low dose of local anesthetic it's much more than that and therefore i want to emphasize certain things which you should remember which you should recollect before you enter the ot for giving spinal for cesarean section coming back to our patient what was the scene there was a gravid uterus causing aorto cable compression which was left unattended a reverse trendelenburg position was given to the patient fearing high spinal forgetting that it is going to impede the venous return to a larger extent as against in non parturients a search was going on for infra diaphragmatic iv access now this is almost criminal for obstetric patients if there are no veins that can be found on the upper limb do not hesitate to open the neck veins in pregnant patients the biggest anatomical change in pregnancy as we all know is the aorto cable syndrome and in near miss situations we always miss to consider it mostly because maybe we are working single handedly but then one can always ask the obstetricians to help us out they are well versed with this anatomical and pathophysiology of the aorto cable compression syndrome so yes do not forget the left uterine displacement which is to be done in all pregnant women with more than 20 weeks of gestation so when you enter the ot for giving spinal in cesarean section or to anesthetize a patient for cesarean section remind yourself that whenever there is any complication or even preemptively you are going to give left uterine displacement now what is the correct method of giving left uterine displacement it is the one obviously which is the most effective you can use either a two handed technique or a single handed technique wherein you either push the uterus or you pull the uterus on the other side if you have a remotely controlled operation table theater uh, table 
you can just tilt it to 30 degrees you can use any of these methods whichever you are comfortable to relieve the iota cable compression so what we did in our patient we gave an immediate manual left uterine displacement the iv axis was taken on other hand the drug of choice for high spinal like in any other case was atropine followed by fluid resuscitation the patient was made supine and if at all you are fearing the high spinal give a propped up position but never a reverse trendelenburg position in a pregnant patient now despite of all this awareness and all these actions and inter uh, interruptions for treating the complications of spinal anesthesia there are reports of cardiac arrest after cesarean section under subarachnoid block so what to do if the near miss situations are converted into cardiac arrest there are many reports like epidural spinal or combined spinal epidural where in cardiac arrest has occurred there are many review articles wherein they have shown that spinal anesthesia has led to cardiac arrest epidural anesthesia was given to a patient with ropivacaine which is a more cardio stable drug and yet there was cardiac arrest and something as simple as bezoal jaris reflex has also caused cardiac arrest so what to do when the situation goes out of control and you have lost treating the near miss situation and you land up with cardiac arrest obviously you are going to resuscitate the patient with modifications relevant to pregnancy if you look at this algorithm it is very confusing and complicated so what i have tried today is i have simplified this algorithm in such a way that i would be narrating the cpcr with changes pertinent to pregnancy and obstetric cardiac arrest i have highlighted them so they will be the salient features which will grab your attention and which will stay with you to till the end of the lecture at least so yes it is going to be cab circulation airway and breathing priorities of pregnant women in cardiac arrest is high quality cpr and relief of iota cable compression so this is what is different the second point is we have to simultaneously evaluate for the cause and the treatment so both these points we are going to deal separately left uterine displacement has to be continuous and manual regarding chest compressions everything remains the same the same force the site however should be little higher now why i said it should be manual in cpcr because if you are tilting the table the efficiency of the chest compressions would automatically reduce so it is advisable to give a manual left uterine displacement in case there is a cardiac arrest rest of the things like firm background the rate and depth all remain the same airway one has to open the airway use the brick if required bag mask the patient if you need to put an airway you have to put an oropharyngeal airway for obvious reasons in pregnancy if at all you have applied cricoid pressure which is controversial in itself remove it if it is impeding either ventilation oxygenation or intubation if intubation is warranted it has to be done by the most experienced anesthetist inside the ot because you do not want many attempts and a smaller size endotracheal tube has to be put with the aim for etco2 at least 10 mm of mercury if it is a shockable rhythm we are going to shock the patient the impedance in pregnancy is the same so similar energy requirements would be there prefer pads then paddles anterolateral placement is recommended the lateral pad should be placed under the breast tissue like i said energy requirements would be same now what is different here is the presence of fetal monitors if you have assistance the assistant may engage in disconnecting these fetal monitors but if you are alone do not waste time in detaching the fetal monitors keep them as they are wherever they are because fetal monitoring is not going to disrupt the energy pathway so keep them as they do not waste time in disconnecting them iv access like i mentioned earlier should be always above the diaphragm if massive obstetric hemorrhage is the cause of the cardiac arrest volume repletion as per the protocol has to be followed the drugs in cpr there 
are no changes in the choice or the dose of the drugs. They remain the same as in non parturient. Now, this is the RCOG maternal collapse algorithm. It looks complicated, but believe me, everything is the same as in non parturient. The ratio of CPR 30 to 2, everything is the same. And what I've simplified till now is all there in this algorithm. Now, what is different? is how long would you continue resuscitating a pregnant woman who has cardiac arrest. Now, that is where you have to make the path-breaking decision of PMCD, which is perimortem caesarean delivery, if the patient's gestational age is more than 20 weeks. What is this PMCD? The aim of PMCD is to expedite delivery after maternal cardiac arrest, wherein you have to follow the four minute rule. The incision should be within four minutes of arrest and delivery should be carried out within five minutes. Now, this is very challenging for the obstetrician who may prefer giving a vertical incision. That is the obstetrician's expertise. But as an anesthetist, you have to keep track of the timing as to how many minutes have you actually resuscitated the patient and if four minutes have already passed and if you are not able to resuscitate, you can summon the team to do a PMCD. Now, why is PMCD advocated? Sudden and dramatic improvements in pulseless pregnant patients have been reported after uterine evacuation. So yes, it may be good. Maternal status did not deteriorate with PMCD. PMCD has either led to improvement or it has kept the condition city all. No deterioration in the maternal status was found. Now, cardiac arrest can occur anywhere in the casualty in the labor ward. So, in that case, you cannot waste time shifting the patient from the ward to the operation theater for doing the caesarean section. And then you have to do the caesarean section at the location of the cardiac arrest which is called as the on-site PMCD. This will be done with only scalpel and the sterility would become secondary in these cases. Like I mentioned earlier, after you start resuscitation, simultaneously you are supposed to identify the causes and start the treatment. So again, before entering the OT for caesarean section, you have to keep certain things in mind, the different drugs that you are going to use and the patient's condition so that you can differentially diagnose the patient and the cause yourself and start the necessary treatment. For example, if you have given spinal and the patient goes into arrest after spinal but before incision, so it is likely to be basal gyrus reflex, give atropine, give volume resuscitation. Now, if you have given epidural or spinal, we all know that the epidural veins are engorged in pregnancy and there are high chances of LA toxicity. So if the signs and symptoms are uh, showing LA toxicity, are signifying LA toxicity, give intralipid. If the arrest while the uterus is being manipulated during section, it is likely to be amniotic fluid embolism or venous thromboembolism. Institute CPCR immediately. If the patient is PIH receiving magnesium and she develops a rest on table, probably she is going into eclampsia or she may, ha may be having magnesium toxicity, give calcium. Remember, we are going to give oxytocin in caesarean section. So if everything is all right and the patient has flushing, chest pain during closure of uterus, probably it is oxytocin that is causing hypotension and there are reports of cardiac arrest following oxytocin. So stop the trip. There are other alternatives that can be used in place of oxytocin. So this is how you can differentially diagnose and start the appropriate treatment while continuing the resuscitation. Now, despite of all this knowledge and appropriate and timely uh, intervention, there are yet case reports of cardiac arrest in pregnancy. So maternal mortality is there. That brings us to our second case. Again, the lecturer here was on emergency duty. Orchidectomy was going on under spinal anesthesia inside the OT. The PG, that is the postgraduate, receives a call from the labor room. The call is for IV access securement in an eclamptic patient. The senior resident with one PG 
they go to see the patient in the labor ward and what do they see they find an obese parturient weighing approximately 110 kgs 32 weeks of gestation who lies in post ectal phase saturation is 85% bp 210 by 110 heart rate is 86 per minute a pink for this sputum can be seen from the coming from the mouth magnesium and labetalol is loaded in the syringe by the obgy however there is no iv access now, while the anesthetist is attempting to take IV, patient is still throwing silent fits. PG is trying to keep the airway open, manages somehow to put the oropharyngeal airway. IV access is taken, magnesium and labetalol are injected as per the institute's protocol. The saturation still is 85%, basal crepts are present and need of intubation warranted. But the patient is obese is anticipated difficult airway, would need ramp position, help, bougie, monitors, and more importantly, the friendly atmosphere of the operation theater. Meanwhile, the obstetricians decide to do LACS. So the anesthetist continues to give oxygen by mask. The PG gives continuous manual left uterine displacement and the team shifts the patient to the OT for intubation followed by cesarean section. Patient is wheeled inside the OT. Necessary equipments are ready. The OBGY is scrubbed. One PG is giving manual left uterine displacement throughout. Inside the OT, BP is 140 by 90 millimeters of mercury. Heart rate is 70 per minute. Saturation is 85. ECG is normal sinus rhythm. So the drugs have acted in controlling the BP. Patient is semi conscious, irritable, and disoriented. NBM status is 4 hours of starvation. RAM position is given in view of obesity. Crash induction is done with thiopentone. Now, there is a dilemma regarding the use of scoline because of the convulsions, but yet it is given anticipating difficult airway. Intubation is done in first attempt using Buji. The Cormac Lehan is grade 3. It is confirmed by capnography. VEC is administered. Obstetricians are about to take the incision but there's suddenly a flat line on ECG. Asystolitis, so ACLS algorithm is instituted. Chest compressions are started. Atropine adrenaline is given. There is return of spontaneous circulation. Incision is taken. Adrenaline infusion is kept ready. Now, after uh, before reaching the uterus, again, there is a flat line on ECG. Chest compressions are begun. Adrenaline is administered and simultaneously evacuation of uterus is continued. There is return of spontaneous circulation. Incision to delivery time is three minutes quite quick. But while the baby is being brought out, the normal sinus rhythm on ECG changes to ventricular fibrillation. So defib comes into picture. Shock is delivered. Chest compression continued. Repeat shock almost five times given. Amiodarone, xylocart administered. After 25 minutes of continuous resuscitation, the ETCO2 doesn't rise beyond 5 millimeters of mercury and there is no return of spontaneous circulation. The patient succumbed despite timely and appropriate management. Baby is intubated by the pediatrician and shifted to NICU. Presumptive diagnosis for this patient was made as follows morbidly obese parturient with severe PIH, complicated with eclampsia, brought in acute pulmonary edema with probably hypertensive encephalopathy, query amniotic fluid embolism. Now, the confirmative diagnosis can only be attained by autopsy. What was the retrospective history of this patient? The patient was 25 years old, primary working woman. She was diagnosed at as PIH at 28 weeks with a BP of 180 by 110 millimeters of mercury. She was advised admission at that time, which she denied. She went home with the prescription of labetalol tablets and there were no ANC visits whatsoever after that. She came on the ill-fated day directly with convulsions. She was an educated and working to be mother. So why did this happen? despite all appropriate efforts taken by the healthcare providers.
in pregnancy there is asymmetry between people's expectations and the reality of the risk people think oh i am only having a baby it's just natural and the ignorance from patient side was too much in this patient, in this particular case so all these crevices have to be filled you know in the anc visit we doing everything yet the patient being lost is very traumatic now do not be disheartened or demotivated by the negative outcome of this case there are several success stories of resuscitation when obstetric hemorrhage is the cause of cardiac arrest most of the times we are able to successfully resuscitate the patients there are, there are many such case reports something as threatening as amniotic fluid embolism has also been successfully resuscitated in this particular case where in successful resuscitation after maternal cardiac arrest by immediate cesarean section in the labor room was done so this was on site cesarean section that was done with a successful outcome so we need to work as an whole team to gift the to be mother the safe motherhood now despite of knowing adequate theory and all the practical tips we may still fail in giving the successful outcome so what is required at this stage other than knowing the algorithms and beyond is the training programs there are several training programs moet also and prompt but again what is important is teams that work together should also train together with regular training taking place on the labor ward rather than on away days so the staff the mpws the obstetricians and the anesthetist have to be trained together in the labor ward then only we can have a successful outcome so to summarize maternal cardiac arrest is rare and it is the rarity that creates more challenges prompt cpr with pertinent modifications to pregnancy to not forget left uterine displacement to not forget to administer oxygen at an early stage these are necessary for optimal outcome the single most important factor for improving survival of mother and baby is a well prepared time conscious keep a track of time very very important and of course team approach despite all efforts if rosc is not attained show your presence of mind and summon the team to do pmcd because it is the last hope that can probably save the patient thank you very much as in is this slide also you can see that other than the two people involved actively in the cpr the other person is equally important who is giving the left uterine displacement manually i'm so sorry for the technical delay today for the live lecture but please forgive me this was my amateur attempt and i hope you have enjoyed this session of mine thank you very much i would like to end the session now thank you for your patient hearing everyone and thank you hetal sir for bearing with me yesterday and even today for guiding through the technical glitches thank you so much